All right. Today is Thursday, June 24th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. We have a lot of important events that took place today with implications for the overall stock market, chiefly the infrastructure bill. So it appears that we have an agreement so far on a $1 trillion bill for infrastructure. Of course, we know that this will be the first bill of many bills of a quote-unquote infrastructure package. So the fiscal spending, the tsunami of fiscal spending is about to happen. So all of those who are betting against inflation, saying that it's going to be transitory, forget about it. Wait till you see the tsunami of fiscal spending. Likewise, we have news regarding uh, big tech and regulations, and we will cover all of that during the headlines of the day video. But for this video, we're sticking to the technicals and the analysis of the stock market itself. And without further ado, let's get it on. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green, leading the pack today with about 322.58 points, or a gain of 0.59%. The Nasdaq closing in the green by 97.98 points, or a gain of 0.69%. The S&P 500 also closing in the green by 24.65 points, or a gain of 0.58%. What about the sector's performance today? Leading the pack at number one, and capturing the gold medal, energy. At number two for the silver, financials. And by the way, we have news after hours regarding the Fed stress test. And all of the financial institutions passed the test and that will allow a tsunami of buybacks. And therefore, financials are not dead. Matter of fact, they are the best idea of investing right now. And here it is at number three for the bronze basic materials. We don't have any major laggards for the day. Pretty much every single sector of the market managed to close in the green. So we are not shaming any sector. What about the advance to decline ratio, NYSE, 73% advancing versus 25% declining. The NASDAQ, 68% advancing versus 29% declining. You're seeing this tide shift slightly, not very apparent, but when you look under the hood for the market today, you can see that this migration to big cap technology stocks and the NASDAQ is starting to fade away. And the market perhaps is readying for a re-migration back to the inflationary side of the market right after the infrastructure bill. Because you have bad news for the NASDAQ regarding regulatory action, but you have good news for the inflationary side of the market due to the infrastructure bill. Moving on to futures, what's going on here? We have crude oil prices stabilizing at around 73 for the WTI and 75 for the crude oil brand. Modest gains for the day for both. What about softs? The story remains lumber. Another day and more declines for lumber futures. They remain elevated from pre-pandemic levels, but way off the highs. And the question is, when will the housing mania restart? My answer is, wait for prices to go down slightly, and the mania will resume once again, and lumber prices will also recover as a result. The technicals don't matter for now for lumber futures, because so long as we get these uh, data, we got two of them this week for existing and new home sales, and both disappointed tremendously and that is adding pressure on lumber futures but at some point somebody's going to pull the trigger here and say you know what lumber prices are way down are we going to restart and resume our construction projects adding supply into the market that will add downward pressure on home prices and the demand will start once again and here we go season two of the housing mania we also saw declines for coca and cotton futures nothing major all under one percent declines likewise we saw modest gains gains for coffee futures, but sizable gains for both OJ and sugar futures. What about metals? Boy, gold doesn't look good here. I closed all of my gold calls, GLD calls. Perhaps I'm mistaken, but it is not looking good here. The US dollar went down slightly. It is not popping higher, but gold and silver continue to decline, along with copper, by the way, today. Is this an indicator that the pop in the US dollar is not over? Perhaps. But you have to understand that the infrastructure bill, more spending, will add downward pressure on the US dollar. So why aren't gold, silver, and copper moving? higher. 
Perhaps they're waiting for a confirmation of the declines in the US dollar. And that will happen if the US dollar drops all the way down to 91 and even better to 90. We're still a long way from there. And therefore, we're seeing declines for gold, silver, and copper futures. Meanwhile, modest gains for both platinum and palladium futures. What about meats? The gains are led by feeder cattle futures. Meanwhile, live cattle futures were muted for the day. And unfortunately, lead hogs aka the big tech or shall we say formally known as the big tech are falling below the critical and highly important level of 100 the technical damage is done already and perhaps the best gains for lean hogs futures are behind us does it mean that lean hogs futures are going to collapse all the way to pre-pandemic levels not at all they will stay elevated but perhaps the impulsive moves to the upside are over we are now entering a period of reconstruction Perhaps for another rally to come, but until then, the best gains are perhaps behind us for lean hogs. What about grains? We're seeing a mixed picture here. Declines for soybeans, soybean meal, corn, wheat, rough rice, all declining today. Meanwhile, we have gains for canola, oats, and soybean oil futures. Now, mind you, corn and soybeans futures move downward due to the improvement in the weather in the corn belt we get some rain over there however before you start counting your soybeans here's the problem farmers have been waiting and waiting and waiting for rain to come the region has been experiencing extreme drought at least in iowa nebraska north dakota and now when rain comes it comes in the form of hail hailstorm cuts portion of Iowa's corn yield potential by 10 to 15 percent. Agronomist says soybeans damaged by hailstorm have a chance to bounce back, but if they don't, then watch out for soybeans and corn futures to rise higher again. We have some pictures for you here for the damage. You can see the corn and soybeans, the fields are all damaged by the hailstorms. This is at least in Iowa, the largest producer of corn in the country. Moving on to the big casino, the options market. What's going on here? The hottest table remains Apple, at number one. With about 1.2 million contracts, about 79% of those were calls. And here it is, at number two. Tesla, the souffle, the leader of the NASDAQ today, popping significantly higher. Watch the volume. The move in Tesla, the stock that is moving higher, came hand in hand with elevated options volume so this is an option story and we've been talking for over a week now the implied volatility for tesla is extremely low it has been consolidating in range for a long time this is the time to buy options with a souffle but what do you know those who bought call options were rewarded handsomely because that iv rank went from about zero to now about 13 and a half percent we saw some of these options gaining about a thousand percent in a single day today the souffle at number two with about 1.2 million contracts about 54 percent of those were calls of course we're going to cover the chart of tsla during the technical analysis and here it is at number three a planned AMC with about 820,000 contracts, about 64% of those were calls. A slight improvement from the number yesterday, and we know why. They're buying call options expiring tomorrow. They're betting for a pop tomorrow. These are lottery tickets. If they hit, they hit. If they don't, they don't. But remember, we have the IWM shuffling tomorrow, and it will have significant implications on AMC shares. But you also have to be aware of the following we have other meme stocks rising with better opportunities by the way than amc because the implied volatility for amc remains extremely high and those who bought call options and even put options lost a lot of money this week and the reason is the stock pretty much traded flat within range and even when the stock popped higher those call options actually lost money because the premiums remain extremely elevated and options traders are finding opportunity in other names. The likes of Wish, the likes of Palantir. Watch out for Palantir. The IV rank was about zero. Now it's about 1.38%. If that starts to move higher, then watch out for Palantir popping higher and those call options appreciating handsomely. And therefore, I bought some call options for PLTR. But we have other names that are also stealing the thunder from AMC. The likes of Clover, Workhorse, etc. Perhaps offering a better 
better opportunity. Moving on to the unusual activities, the interesting trades of the day. What about the ticker VIPS for VIP shop? Yesterday, we did not make a video, but during the unusual, excuse me, we didn't make a video, so there was not during. Looking at the unusual activities yesterday, I, only I, noticed highly unusual activities for these Chinese names, whether, the, whether it is uh, Pinduoduo, Baidu, etc. And you're seeing these names popping higher today. Vip Shop is no exception, and they're betting for more gains to come by buying the 22 calls expiration date July 2nd, with expectations that the name will pop by over 10.5% by then. They paid about 35 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about 735 thousand dollars what about the trade for the ticker ocgn oxygen this is yet another meme stock with high short interest i believe over 30 percent and once again perhaps this is a better opportunity than amc the stock is trading below 10 bucks you can buy one share of amc costing you 60 bucks but you can buy about six to seven shares of ocgn and the options remain cheaper than amc and therefore you're seeing this migration from the meme maniacs from amc to other stocks one of them is ocgn and they are betting for more gains here by buying the nine bucks calls expiration date july 2nd with expectations that the name will pop by over 11 percent by then they paid about 55 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $1 million. What about the trade for the ticker SDGR? This is for Schrodinger. Very interesting trade, by the way. This is, despite the name, actually an American company, not based in Germany, not based in Austria, based in New York. It is a healthcare software company, and it is based, the name that is, based on the great physicist, this, 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 Erwin Schrodinger, Austrian physicist. In this case, they're buying the 85 calls expiration date July 16th, with expectations that the name will rise by over 8.5% by then, and they paid about a buck and 40 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about one and a half million dollars what about the trade for the ticker aapl apple they're buying the 144 calls expiration date july 30th with expectations that the name will pop by over eight percent by then and they paid about 85 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars now i made a contrarian trade this one because i bought apple puts the name is overextended the move went way higher and we have more regulatory action and also there is some technical damage not any major technical damage but a minor one so i'm bidding for a slight pullback in this name this bid however is a little further in the horizon and they're bidding and they're seeing more gains to come for apple what about the trade for the ticker fb facebook they're buying the 360 calls expiration date july 9th with expectations that the name will rise by over five percent by then they paid about a buck and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about one million dollars what about the trade for the ticker pdd pindudo i spotted the unusual activities yesterday and the name popped higher today and they're betting for more gains to come here by buying the 137 calls expiration date june 16 excuse me july 16th with expectations that the name will rise by over seven percent by then and they paid about two bucks and 30 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about one and a half million dollars and by the way you see the trade for palantir i'm not going to cover this one but i did follow it continuing with interesting trades what's going on here xle the energy etf they're betting for more gains to come for the energy sector and we're hearing calls for a hundred bucks a barrel by the end of the summer for crude oil i wouldn't go as far as a hundred but I see 80, 85 as a possibility. And the reason is, if the price goes all the way to 100, then that will start to ignite the shale boom once again. Now we know that Saudi Arabia and Russia will not be excited if the shale boom restarts here in the United States. And they will put a cap on the rally in crude oil. Anyhow, we have a bullish call here, buying the 61 calls expiration date, August 20th with expectations that the name will rise by over 11% by then, and they paid about 80 cents a piece to enter 
the trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $400,000. What about the trade for the ticker LVS, Las Vegas Sands? Dropping by a lot today, but we know that Las Vegas is on fire. And usually the summer is not the hottest season in Las Vegas. But people are getting out and about and international travel is still out of the question so we're seeing massive inflow in las vegas and here we have a bullish trade buying the dip in lvs specifically the 60 excuse me the 56 calls expiration date july 16th with expectations that lvs will rise by over eight percent by then and they paid about 55 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, bringing the total to about $200,000. What about the trade for the ticker FTCH, Farfetch? They're buying the 65 calls expiration date August 20th, with expectations that the name will rise by over 24% by then. And they're not seeing this as a far-fetched goal, because they're paying about $1.85 a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on this trade alone lastly what about the trade for the ticker fdx fedex this is an earnings play by the way fedex reported earnings after the bell in the name last time i checked is trading down by a lot so perhaps this was a successful trade because they bought the 287 and a half puts expiration date tomorrow friday june 25th and they were expecting FedEx to drop by over 5.5% by then. They paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $400,000. Moving on to the heat map analysis. Pretty much everything is lining up green, but this is the beauty of doing the heat map analysis. The inflationary sectors of the market financials industrials energy materials doing exceptionally good today in contrast the disinflationary side of the market of technology high multiple names we have a mixed performance here some of the high multiple names managed to outperform these are the chinese names penduru gd alibaba in addition to Tesla. So we're seeing some names moving based on the options activities. And the tech sector overall is doing pretty good. However, notice the underperformance of big cap technology names. Whether it is Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, but specifically Amazon. The prime day numbers came out a little disappointing because they were on par of last year. No growth whatsoever. So is this a canary in a coal mine? A leading indicator that this Nasdaq trade that we have witnessed the last few weeks, the leadership of the Nasdaq, which we anticipated, by the way, is this about to fade away as we see more scrutiny and more regulations for the big cap technology names? Will the Nasdaq leadership fade away if we go back to the inflationary stocks now that we know the infrastructure bill has the green light from both Democrats and Republicans? Another notable ad performer today was in the healthcare sector, Eli Lilly, the ticker LLY, rising by over 7% today, and the reason is the optimism that the FDA will approve the Alzheimer drug from Eli Lilly. And that, by the way, came on the expense of another name, Biogen, the ticker BIIB, down big today. And remember, Biogen popped by over 40% upon the news that the FDA gave the green light for their own Alzheimer drug. Now that Eli Lilly is entering the competition, Eli Lilly rising higher, Biogen dropping by a lot. We also saw the infrastructure specific names at performing today caterpillar all the tools names illinois tools even names like fastnell that's about to pop higher in the materials sector we have names related to infrastructure whether it is steel aluminum copper all rising higher and to shed more light on that we're moving to the themes analysis starting with the reopening names we have a mixed picture here mostly in the green with the gains led by Cody. Meanwhile, the losses led by Royal Caribbean. We have bad news for the sailing industry in general because you had Carnival Cruises CEO coming out in an interview and saying that the challenges the cruise industry is facing are coming from the variations of regulations. The CDC might say one thing, but you have localities saying another. And even the destinations that these cruises are going to have different regulations. Mind you, of course, we have this uh, Delta variant spreading around and we know that cruises are the first place to run out of if we indeed see a spread 
of the Delta variant in this country. What about the inflationary stocks? Lighting up green for the most part, specifically the infrastructure-related names. We have Freeport McMoran, we have Martin Marietta, the poster boy for the infrastructure bill. Rising higher, and this name has to be in every portfolio, by the way. And I gave you the Biden stocks last year. These are the stocks you want to invest in if Biden becomes president. And indeed, these stocks, for the most part, managed to outperform the rest of the market. Another name, Alcoa, also trading higher. I don't have any steel names listed here, but you know that steel is part of infrastructure, and we saw steel names also rising higher today. Likewise, expect banks to pop higher tomorrow, and they were already trading higher in anticipation of this uh, outcome, which is the Fed stress test. Every single financial institution managed to pass the test. How could they not when the Federal Reserve banned bankruptcy? No company can file for bankruptcy because the Fed, Papa Jerome, got your back, meaning that banks' earnings and banks' balance sheets will thrive. Matter of fact, Pretty much every bank in the country, with the exception of Wells Fargo, has excess cash in their balance sheets, excess reserves that they have to unleash either in the economy or, and here is the key word, buybacks. Prepare for the tsunami of buybacks in banks and financial stocks. Combine that with the possibility of rates rising higher once again, and we have the best environment for the financial sector of the market since pre the financial crisis. What about the disinflationary stocks rising when rates go down? All in all, also outperforming. We're seeing gains across the board, specifically for Tesla, and the momentum continues for Peloton. This week is pretty much the tide that lifts all boats. We have the lack of any catalyst, any negative catalyst, to derail the rally. In addition, we have the Federal Reserve walking back the comments from last week. And notice how all of a sudden Bullard is not allowed to talk anymore. Nobody's doing interviews with Bullard. And we have other Fed members coming out, even ex-Fed members, the likes of Dudley, saying pay no attention to Bullard or Kaplan. The only three people in the Fed worthy of paying attention to are Jerome Powell, Vice Chairman Clarida, and New York Fed President Williams. Why? Because these are the pumpers. Williams came out and said forget about Bullard. I don't see inflation. I don't see tapering. I don't see raising interest rates. Print baby print. Keep the casino going on hot. And all of a sudden Wall Street has a darling. A new one in Fed President Williams. Moving on to charts. Starting with the SPY 30 minutes chart. We did not have a video yesterday, so let's talk about this. Yesterday, we saw the chart consolidating just above the very important support level of 423. And then the last 30 minutes candle of the day was a flush down. And looking at this chart, I was worried that this is another bear trap because we saw another one last Friday. The SPY gap below 417. And then the last 30 minutes candle was a massive flush down, and even I fell for it. I did not bet on it, but I fell for it from my analysis, saying that the next destination should be 412. What do you know? That was a bear trap, and the SPY had this massive rebound higher. So yesterday, this time I learned the lesson, and looking at the candle, breaking the support of 423, in my head, I, by the way, I know what you're going to say. You're lying, bro. You didn't say that. I actually recorded a program yesterday, but I did not finish it because I had to go out for something. But I still have the recording. And in the recording, I said, watch out. This could be another bear trap what do you know it is indeed a bear trap because the spy popped higher gapping higher reaching all the way the very important resistance level of 425.45 not quite making it breaking above that level but consolidating just underneath that level now we have a gap open and my bet is that the spy will go down to close this gap before climbing above 425.45 at least this will be the healthy way and the reason is we have a massive iwm matter of fact the entire russell whether it is the 2000 or 1000 we have a massive reconstruction happening tomorrow we will see a lot of volatility in many different names across the market some of these names happen to be included in the spy and therefore expect a lot of volatility tomorrow and my bet is we should go down close that gap and then take it from there because if the spy continues to rally higher breaking above 425.25.45 excuse me that would not be healthy and it will be a bull trap 
We saw the bear trap, we could see the bull trap, and therefore anticipating closing the gap first. And here is a daily chart for the continuous contract for the S&P 500. The momentum indicators are curling upward. This is bullish. The RSI, the MACD, all trending higher now. This is a bullish sign. Furthermore, the chart is trading at all-time highs, well above 4,232. Is this bullish or is this bearish? It is bullish. The problem is, the bears would argue that this so-called recovery and reversal higher in the SPY came out due to a decreasing volume. The volume was extremely low the last few days. And if the volume resumes in the market, that volume will be to the downside. If we see the volume spiking higher tomorrow due to the Russell reconstruction, then the rational move will be to the downside for the SPY if we see the volume elevating higher. And if that move happens, to the downside that is, the SPY futures should crack below 4,000. 232 once again. Absent of any elevation in volume, the trend remains higher until we get a resistance level. And we will get this when the chart shows any sign of a reversal. For now, we don't have any sign of a reversal whatsoever. Moving on to the Q's 30 minutes chart. Just like we saw with the SPY, the tide that lifted all boats, the Q's also gapping higher today. And this is even weaker than the SPY. If you are a bear making a case for a reversal. And the reason is, we know that this has been a bipolar market. We're not going to see the SPY, the inflationary stocks, and the NASDAQ rallying all together. One of these will reclaim the leadership of the market once again. If the bet is the infrastructure stocks, the inflationary stocks will reclaim the leadership. And now we have concerns, regulatory concerns for the NASDAQ. At least the NASDAQ should go down and close the gap. For now, the sky is the limit. We don't even know where the resistance level is because there is no signal for reversal whatsoever. Once we get the signal, whether it is a gap and crap, whether it is a reverse hammer on the daily chart, whether it is a gap lower, whether it is a reversal intraday with higher volume, all of these are signs for a reversal. We don't have any of these today so far. So for now, we don't even have a resistance level to play with. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract of the NASDAQ? One could look at the candle and say, okay, the NASDAQ is running out of gas. It's running out of steam. This move has been extremely sharp and steep. I get it. But for now, the momentum indicators, RSI, MACD, all trading higher in a healthy trend. The RSI is getting a little overextended, but it can still go a little higher. Absent of a reversal signal, we cannot make a bearish conclusion for the NASDAQ futures. The only concerning sign, once again, is the very low volume the NASDAQ and the market as a whole been witnessing throughout the week. But here's the clue. Midday today, we saw the volume slightly elevating in the Nasdaq. And that elevation in volume did not push the Nasdaq higher. It actually pushed the Nasdaq lower, specifically for Apple. So could this be the sign, the leading indicator that the Nasdaq is about to reverse tomorrow? We'll see. But here's perhaps the most important chart to watch in tomorrow's activities. The IWM 30 minutes chart. You want to talk about a steep move higher? Here it is. The 30 minutes RSI is showing a ceiling. We have massive reconstruction about to happen in the Russell 2000 tomorrow. The assumption is we will see lots of selling of names that are about to be dropped out of the Russell 2000. So the natural conclusion is the Russell will go down and then we will have new names being added into the Russell 2000. These are the names that will pop higher significantly. So my expectations are that the IWM will pull back tomorrow and I already bought put options expiring tomorrow. These are lottery tickets. If they don't work, they don't work. But making the rational conclusion here, the IWM should drop tomorrow due to the reconstruction, and therefore I bought some put options. What about the Dixie, the dollar index? This is starting to look a little concerning, as if the US dollar is not finished popping higher. And if that is the case, then we're about to see another flush down in metals, if not commodities in general. Commodities, gold and silver in specific, should not feel safe at all until the US dollar goes down all the way to 91, preferably breaking that support. Absent of that, it looks to me that the US dollar 
is attempting to pop higher. I don't understand why, because we have another massive infrastructure bill, the tune of about $1 trillion, about to hit the economy. But is the US dollar hinting that the taper tantrum is not finished yet, meaning we're about to get another piece of data that will spark the taper tantrum discussion once again? That could be the case. And here it is, gold. What's going on here? Not looking good. Even though the chart is oversold, but it is concerning, specifically when you look at the dollar index. And if the US dollar pops higher tomorrow, you will see gold violating the Fibonacci retracement level support. And therefore, I closed all of my GLD calls yesterday at a slightly lower profit than I expected. And perhaps this is a mistake because what do you know? You wake up tomorrow and you see gold popping higher. I don't care. For now, it is stressful for me to hold gold knowing that the US dollar has the potential, the technical potential at least, of popping higher. What about yields? What's going on here? We were talking about an ABC pattern that appears to be out of the window now because this doesn't look as an ABC pattern. That doesn't mean that the bullish outlook is out of the window. It means that this is a consolidation underneath the extremely important resistance formerly support level of 1.5%. I have no doubt in my mind that if yields capture, recaptures 1.5%, that the next destination will be 1.55 basis points and then 1.6 once again. Folks, the spending machine is not over yet. The Fed continues to print $120 billion and feeding Wall Street via bond purchases and mortgage-backed securities purchases. For now, that could keep the lid on yields rising higher. But this artificial lid will be blown to oblivion given the facts that we have massive fiscal spending, that inflation continues to rise higher, not lower. And the bond market has to come to an agreement here. Yes, tapering will be bad for the prospects of economic growth, and therefore, maybe that merits yields to go down. But for now, the fact that the Fed is not tapering, that will also allow inflation to continue to rise higher. And perhaps when the Fed gets to the point of tapering, the economy will be already at a white hot inflation and perhaps stagflation. And at some point, the tantrum has to stop and yields will pop higher. Remember, yields are indicators of two things. These are long end yields, the 10, the 20, and the 30 years yield. Number one, they're indicators of inflation. If inflation is about to rise higher, then yields also rise higher. But they're also indicators of economic growth and economic optimism in the future. And therefore, you're seeing this confusion and mixed signals with the bond market not sure where to park yields at. In my opinion, this confusion will be resolved very soon. What about the VIX? What's going on here? The VIX falling below 15 for a little while before recovering higher again. And we are watching and anticipating if the VIX will be able to recover the trend line by the end of the week, meaning tomorrow. What we know for now, and this is a four hours chart, by the way, the RSI is oversold indicating that perhaps the VIX will pop higher tomorrow. Could the reconstruction of the IWM be the reason for the VIX popping higher? That certainly could be. Of course, due to the action we saw in the market today, no one is anticipating a correction in the SPY tomorrow or next week. But this is how corrections happen, out of the blue. This is how VIX pops happen, out of the blue. When nobody's anticipating a pop in the VIX, the VIX pops higher. Now, the folks at the Russell always say, we're going to try to make the reconstruction process to be as smooth as possible with very little volatility. But again, it is unpreventable. The volatility will happen either way because traders and investors will try to play the guessing game. If this name is about to be dropped out of the Russell, we should sell and bet against this name. On the other hand, if another name is about to be included in the Russell 2000, Perhaps we should buy this name. And if there is a name migrating from the Russell 2000 to the Russell 1000, the Russell 2000 will be selling this name. Meanwhile, the Russell 1000 will be buying this name. In this case, GameStop. So GameStop will be extremely important to watch tomorrow. Anyhow, just like we saw with last Friday with Quad Witching, could this be yet another Friday with another pop in the VIX? Remember, so far, up until last week, Fridays were known as Kill the VIX Fridays because the VIX gets crushed every Friday because in a bubble market, the risk is always to the upside, not to the downside. But are we witnessing a change here where Fridays become the days where VIX pops? We'll see. What about Apple? What's going on here? 30 minutes chart. We saw the gap in crap reversing before reaching 135. Furthermore, 
we have negative divergence in the RSI. In addition, we have the regulatory scrutiny against Apple and the big cap technology names. All six bills, the antitrust bills, passed for now. This is not good news for Apple. The iMob. And of course, Tim Apple is grabbing the phone, calling politicians on speed dial, whether it is the president or Nancy Pelosi, and warning, warning, that if you pass these bills, I'm going to start to crack some kneecaps. This is how our system works. We have a John, and then we have the other word that I cannot use in this program. But anyhow, I'm making a bearish bet here, buying put options, specifically the 130 puts, for Apple, expiring in July, by the way. I'm not anticipating Apple to crash. I'm anticipating a pullback in Apple after this massive pop higher. It looks overextended. It looks like it's running out of gas, and we have negative catalysts starting to appear against Apple. So I am expecting a pullback all the way to 131. If that happens, say tomorrow or next week, I will be closing these put options and taking profits. If the opposite happened and we see Apple popping over 135, then I will be closing these options and taking the loss. What about Tesla, the souffle, popping significantly higher? Wow, it has been knocking at the door of 629 for weeks now, over and over and over again. And I told you we have a massive move coming for Tesla. And my bet is it's going to happen to the upside. And the clue is we had a series of higher lows. The chart looked like as it is preparing to crack above 629. All of that energy is being released right now. But the question is, is Tesla now stalling since it has reached another critical level, a very strong resistance level of 679? We will see tomorrow but the momentum indicators are still positive tesla's trading above 679 and even if it closes below 679 for the week it's not a death sentence you actually want to see it closing that gap and then popping higher again next week the infrastructure bill actually eliminated the EV subsidies, but on the other hand, it's allocating billions of dollars for EV infrastructure, and therefore you saw names like Blink Charging and perhaps Tesla popping higher today. Before the week started, we were debating which trade should we follow, buying calls for Tesla or buying calls for Caterpillar. Here it is, Caterpillar also popping higher today, surprise, surprise. The poster boy for infrastructure along with Martin Marietta. So if you bought calls on Tesla or Caterpillar, you scored big either way. Caterpillar oversold, catching the support of the Fibonacci retracement level. We have now the momentum indicators, the RSI and the MACD curling upward once again. So was that it? The correction in caterpillar and it's about to be in favor once again we'll see but for now those of us who bought the call options it was a little doubtful for a few days but now we know that this was the correct decision what about amc what's going on here 30 minutes chart we have a lower high but within the consolidation range of 52 and 60 is it bad is it good it doesn't really matter because it's a consolidation range and now you know what happens when everybody's already all in amc and they don't have any ammo to pour in buying amc shares or amc call options the stock stalls and that leads us to a very dangerous period for the stock for now, everything is okay. Everybody's all in, and therefore we're seeing call options and the options volume in general drying out from trading above two to three million options to now 700 to 800,000 per day, which is still elevated, but not as much as it used to before. Now, this is the chart to watch, by the way, along with GameStop and the IWM tomorrow, because this is the largest component of the IWM. How will it be impacted by the reshuffling tomorrow? Well, we know if AMC popped higher a little earlier, it would have been included in the reconstruction. It would have been moved from the Russell 2000 to the Russell 1000 because it is a large cap stock now, which is hilarious, by the way. This is the world we're living in. But because the pop in AMC happened after the deadline, which was in May, by the way, it will still be included in the smaller Russell 2000. And that will still give AMC the highest weighting in the IWM. The question is, will the folks over at the IWM start selling AMC to rebalance the weighting that we will see a massive drop for AMC? But if they keep the weighting as is and perhaps buy more shares 
is for AMC for whatever reason, then AMC will pop higher. And the reason why I say that this is a dangerous period for the stock is everybody's all in. They don't have any more cash, any more reserves to buy the stock anymore or even buy call options. They're depending on more entrants in this trade. We're not seeing more apes joining. It's like a pyramid scheme. If you seize recruiting new entrants, the pyramid falls down. All of what it takes is one ape pulling the trigger, pushing the sell button, and you will see the domino effect to the downside. So my advice to the apes is the following. Buy some protection. If you are really with high conviction, betting that this stock will pop higher for whatever reason, a short squeeze, Jesus Christ will come down from heaven and order the shorts to cover their shorts, whatever it is, buy some put options as protection in case the stock goes down for whatever reason. But for now, we have a consolidation range, 52 to 60. Breaking either will open a massive move to that particular direction. But perhaps there are other plays here that are attracting the options betters and the meme betters. For example, CLOV, Clover, you saw the massive pop and then the dump. Pump and dump, going all the way to the Fibonacci retracement level. But now the stock is moving higher once again. It's facing the resistance of another Fibonacci level around 15 bucks, but the stock is trading at around 14 bucks. Ask yourself a question. Is it easier to buy one share of AMC at around 55 bucks? Or is it easier to buy CLOV Clover at around 14 bucks? It is easier to buy CLOV. And therefore, it is easier to sustain the gamma squeeze in this name than AMC. Furthermore, the short float for this name is a lot higher. Watch the MACD indicator because that will tell you the next move for this name. If it starts to curl upward and the stock is not done going higher. But if we see a curling down and the stock is experiencing a loss of momentum and we will see more losses for the name. Perhaps going all the way down to 11 bucks, the next Fibonacci retracement level. Here's another name, Workhorse WKHS. This is a weekly chart. And by the way, I'm still in this name. I have calls in this name. They're already in the money. And I'm just leaving the house money ride all the way till expiration in July. Here's another stock trading at about 15 and a half bucks a share. Ask yourself a question. Is it easier to maintain the gamma squeeze that will eventually lead to a short squeeze in Workhorse trading at 15 bucks or at AMC trading at 55 bucks? It's easier to do it in Workhorse. Furthermore, Workhorse has over 40% of the float shorted. I'm highlighting this zone because the majority of shorts shorted in this zone. So if the stock continues to linger in this zone, matter of fact, starts to move a little higher, or we're seeing the MACD indicator from a weekly perspective curling upward. If that happens and we see the stock trading at 20, 25, the shorts are going to start to scramble to cover their bets. But when they do, this has a higher potential of a short squeeze pop than AMC. And here's another one, weekly chart for good RX. So far, the apes, the memers, and the likes didn't notice this stock yet. It has over 30% short float, and I already bought the stock in anticipation of a short squeeze. Mind you, this company is an actual company, and the financial numbers, the balance sheet, income statement, cash flow, are much, much better than AMC, Workhorse, or Clover. So this could be a legitimate short squeeze. And what I'm asking you is, because I'm not going there again. I'm not going to Wall Street bets anymore. I went there once, I put my mask on, my gloves, my goggles, and when I got out of the dumpster, I was puking all day long. So I'm not gonna go there anymore. But if you do, how about start floating the name GoodRx, GDRx, to these donkeys? Maybe they'll be useful this time around and pump the stock higher. And your boy you're listening to right now, will make a lot of money. What about the tulip market? BTC. We saw the massive reversal, the rescue plan after BTC cracked below 30,000. And some of you, by the way, correctly indicated that the actual support level is not 30,000. It's around 28 and a half, 29. You're actually right from a technical perspective. But the psychology is important too. And the psychological level is 30,000. So I'm combining the technicals and the psychology. And I see 30,000 as the most important level to watch here. Now, remember, the RSI indicator is a leading one, and it is curling upward. The MACD is a lagging indicator, and it is in a battlefield. We have some red impressions in the histogram, but it could break one way or the other. So if the RSI continues to climb higher, the MACD will start registering green impressions in the histogram, and BTC could climb higher. The level to watch for right now is 
35,750. Now, being a little conservative here by pushing the number a little higher, but it happens to be the top of the reversal candle, the red candle. This zone should act as resistance for now. So we're watching 30,000 and 35,750. And here it is, lastly, Doge. You asked me about Doge, here it is. Since the con man Saturday Night Live disaster, the name went down by over 79%. Those who bought Doge in anticipation that the Messiah, Reverend Elon Musk, is about to push Doge to the moon, perhaps got it all wrong because Doge went down to the dumpster. Matter of fact, violating the support level of 21 cents. But like BTC, Perhaps this is another rescue plan, reclaiming 21 cents for support for now. And for now, keyword for now, it is a bear flag formation. If it starts to trade downward once again, then oh boy, that's going to be a really bad, bad signal. If it cracks above, below 21 cents once again, prepare for the tsunami of selling. And that, by the way, will come hand in hand with Bitcoin cracking below 30,000. Moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? Extremely important day. Number one, we have personal income. Number two, we have consumer spending. Number three, perhaps the important one, core PCE price index. And then we have the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. All of these numbers will have tremendous implications on the bonds market and inflation expectations. Furthermore, we have the IWM and the Russell reconstruction. Let me read for you just for you who are not familiar of how the reconstruction works. Here's how the reconstruction works. Each year on May 31st, Russell ranks by market capitalization all stocks traded in US exchanges and a few overseas large caps as well. The top roughly 1,000 stocks qualify for the Russell 1000 the firm's large cap benchmark. The next 2,000 qualify for the Russell 2000, the small stock index. On June 10th, Russell then publishes a list of all the stocks falling out of or being added to each index. But the Russell indices themselves won't be adjusted until after the market close on the last Friday in June, which this year falls on the 24th meaning tomorrow. So, where the fund investors' risk harm is in the intervening weeks, traders can buy the stocks that are due to be added or sell borrowed shares of stocks that are due to be dropped, planning to replace the shares later at lower prices, meaning that the moves you've been seeing in the market for the last few weeks in names like Plug Power, for example, and the likes, are perhaps due to the reconstruction. And tomorrow, we will see lots of pumps and dumps all over the place, and perhaps dumps and pumps for the names that were sold already. And now, these traders have to cover their shorts. The bottom line is, expect more volatility than usual tomorrow. Folks, that's all I got for you tonight, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.